the mess in this attic Lot going on, but there ain't no need to panic Come on up and join, we getting wild, getting manic Spitting truth for all you fanatics you wouldn't want Darth Vader to have a high performance coach. No, he could be so, he'd just be so much more evil. Yeah. Right. You know, like, like you, you do an intake call. Okay, Darth, what's your vision? You know, and it's like, you know, I want to, I, I want to blow up a planet. Every week got something new to say. Ain't no filter. This shit coming straight from the brain. It's coming straight from the brain. Yeah, it's coming straight, coming straight from the brain. What's up, everybody? Today is Friday, June 10th, 2022. This is a talk in the attic, which means, of course, I'm your host, Kirk Ross, coming at you with a really special one today. I sat down with three coaches from Novus Global, a California based company that's actually serving internationally at least through Canada and U.S. It's a high-level, high-performance coaching firm that was founded in part, at least, by Jason Jaggard, one of our three guests today. He also brought with him two of his partner coaches, Dan and Janet. All three of these folks are extremely intelligent, and, of course, they all have high IQ, but what's really impressive with these, with these three and probably with, with high-performing coaches at large is their EQ, their emotional quotient or emotional intelligence uh they they really challenged me so so we get into it we talk a little bit about what novus global is they also run an institute called the meta performance institute which really prepares coaches to enter the the coaching world at least at a, at a higher level than your standard institute would and it's really it's a great conversation uh, we do a little bit of live coaching where i'm the the pupil or the study and they didn't really let me get away with any bullshit and you know what, what i learned from this short conversation is that I've got a lot to learn. And a lot of that is kind of seeing through your own defense mechanisms and as Jason calls them, systems that we all put in place to kind of protect ourselves, really in most cases from fear. Uh, and those fears are sometimes rational and oftentimes they're irrational. So we get into that and I, I felt a little undressed by the end of this thing. I felt a little bit down on myself, but at the same time, I, I've thought a lot about what they taught me and I don't, I don't want to ruin it, but essentially a lot of you out there are going about your day to day. Most of us have an idea what our vision is, but do we really know what our vision is? Can you specify specifically what you're looking to do and by when? Is there a way to quantify it? Is there a metric available? And if there's not, then maybe our vision isn't quite as well prepared or well imagined as we thought. Maybe it's just an impressionistic piece of art as opposed to a very defined rendering of, of, our, of our future. So that's what, what you're about to see. Check out novus.global for more information. Uh, check the show notes for links to Dan and Janet's uh, information as well as Jason's. Thank you, Dan, Janet, and Jason for coming on. I said it a few times during the during the interview itself, but by by golly, I feel like uh, lots of reputation, lots of esteem brought into the show. I appreciate that. For those of you listening to this, please don't forget that we do have a YouTube channel. Uh, this is a video episode, as almost every single episode is. Please like and subscribe and share. No matter what you're doing, I do appreciate that you're tuned in to this, whether you're listening or watching, or maybe just telling me that you're listening or watching. I certainly appreciate it. And I promise to you, Jason, Janet, and Dan, that I will uh, put some time into, into considering what I'd really need to do to make this thing happen. All right. And with that, we're going to jump into this thing. Here's an original song by yours truly leading us in and leading us out. With that, let's start the show. I would I would toss my hair if I had any. <laughs> So, so I don't know, Jason, you probably know this. I don't know if the whole team does, but I, I really, what turned me on to you and to even know about you, obviously, is through Jeff Lambert, one of your clients. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you call them your players or what. We'll get into that later. But he, uh, he's, I was really impressed by him. I have a personal friendship with someone that's close to him. So, you know, I, I it's cool. You guys are bringing a lot of esteem and uh, reputation to this program. So I do appreciate that. It's my pleasure. <laughs> and uh, Jeff's a good man. I like him a lot. 
I've loved working with him over the years. And uh, he, he, he's the only person in my life who I've coached who's, who looked at me in the face, in my face and said, I want to be the best client you've ever had. Mm. And I love, I love that. It's such a, it was, and I was like, you can't hear that and not say, uh, then I want to be the best coach you've ever had. And so right. there's really a, a nice uh, synergistic relationship that's, that's flowed from that. Yeah, so we'll get into the, the dirt on the confidential dirt on Jeff later on. Once we're off the record. <laughs> Not that many people watch great. the show anyway. So um, <laughs> that's great. No, all right. So so I'm here with I'm here with Dan, Jason, and Janet from Novus. Well, what's the name of the company? Novus Global. That's right. Novus Global. It's a coaching firm. You're based out of Los Angeles, California. Is that right? I mean, sure. We've got coaches everywhere. So we've got coaches in, in Canada. Uh, Dan is in Calgary. And uh, Janet is in our neck of the woods, but she's in a cooler place. I'm I'm uh, a little west of the city, and she's a little northeast of the city okay. of Los Angeles. But we've got coaches in South Africa, um, obviously all over Canada, all over the U.S. Am I missing anywhere? Mm-hmm. Yeah, all it. over the U.S. How many how many coaches do you have working for the firm these days? I should know what the answer to that is. But it's changing all the time. <laughs> it's over we twenty five for sure. It's, it's a, I think it's around. At least thirty to thirty-five. If you bring the yeah, if you bring the training yeah. program right now in, it's probably closer to forty. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. Well, that, that's cool. I mean, I think there. I, I don't. I want to make sure this doesn't come across in a, a, a pejorative manner whatsoever. But there are a lot of there's so the coaching field is exploding right now, and anytime there's opportunity like that, you get a lot of kind of BS in there as well. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so we'll get into this yeah. later about kind of how, as someone that would be interested in hiring a coach, you know, how to maybe sift through the 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 good ones and the and the less thans I suppose like finding a good restaurant <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly yeah 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 I, I like that metaphor how so Dan um well it, there's a lot of bad food there's a lot of uh you know you go into kitchens I worked in a restaurant for one month and I learned probably more than I wanted to uh about about restaurant industry but it was just shocking to me like just how different um, yeah, restaurants operate, you go into the back and there's a lot of things they don't want you to see. And, and you can kind of tell like, uh, when you go in, cause anyone can open a restaurant, anyone can, it doesn't <laughs> matter if you're qualified or not. If you just got a little bit of capital and you got somebody who's willing to write, you can hire. My brother was cooking steaks, uh, at a restaurant. He, he was 17 and had no clue what he was doing. Like yeah. absolutely no clue. <laughs> and they were serving what he was making to real human people. So it's like, there's, there's a, I think coaching is a similar sort of, uh, and then like a lot of industries, there's a lot of, there could be a lot of bad. Um, and yeah. so finding the good, we can talk about that, but it is definitely a, there's some, there's some principles to follow in order to find the best possible uh, coaches. Yeah. yeah. And so I guess okay. I'll direct this to you, Janet, because you, you've been, you've been, uh, I haven't gotten to you yet so far. So let's talk about kind of what, <laughs> a, what a basic mix or what, what kind of your cross section of, first off, what do you call your pupils? What is that? Oh, pupils. I like that. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to start calling them that. Uh, clients. <laughs> clients. My eyes. Yeah. yeah. Clients. Yeah. <laughs> clients. Yeah. Okay. So, what, so what's a good mix? Like what, what kind of clients are, are, are you, are you guys coaching? Yeah. Well, right now, I mean, it's all, always uh, ever changing right now. I, I'll just speak for myself. I have um, a roster of, uh, uh, CEOs, C-suite executives, managers, um, people in different industries, uh, you know, uh, startup founders. Um, that's, that's about my roster right now. So a lot is of that pretty representative? Owners. Yeah, that's pretty representative, Jason. It's pretty, is it a pretty executive business focused firm? I would say so. If only the, partially because that's the folks who are usually most committed to some kind of ROI. Yeah. Yeah. So we'd be, we'd be willing to work with other people, but oftentimes we're more like a, a sports car. You know, I, when I, I bought my, I bought a sports car for the first time in my life a couple of years ago and I was driving with a buddy of mine uh, who drive and Dan knows who this guy is. And I think Jana does too. And I was driving with a buddy of mine who, who knows how to drive sports cars. He's got a Porsche and all this kind of stuff. This was not a Porsche, <laughs> but I was driving something less than a Porsche, but still a sports car. <laughs> and we drove around together. I was kind of showing it off and I was happy. And he, he looked at me and he goes, Hey, um, do you, do you want me to show you how to drive this? <laughs> 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 and, and for about half a second, I was offended, but then I was like, this guy knows what he's doing. And so then we, I hopped out and and uh, sat in the driver's seat. And then he, he like let her rip and he showed me what this car that I just got could do. And I think a lot of times that's like 
what coaching is, is you get this thing. Sometimes it's a high price thing and you don't really know how to use it. And so what our coaches in a firm are really good at is showing our clients how to maximize this thing that they've just bought that maybe is Vogue or maybe yeah. their board told, told them they need to get or whatever. So as long as people are willing to explore what's possible with this thing that they bought, then we're excited to work with them. Yeah, that, that reminds, that's reminiscent of something Jeff mentioned, which really uh, piqued my, my interest in what you, what you taught him, this, this idea of moving your intuitive fence and kind of this concept of, as I understand it, I don't need to explain it to you. Explain to me, what is the intuitive fence and how, how do you, how do y'all speak to that? You know, I'll, I'll kick it to, uh, I, I guess I get to pick this time and I'm, I'm not to, not to, I, I, I will, I'm going to punt it to Janet to answer that question, but I will also say, uh, it's, this is fun. The three of us don't get to be on calls very often. And, uh, Janet is, or was the director of our Institute for Meta Performance. So there's a separate company that trains people how to do what we do. Mm. And she ran that for several years. And then Dan is currently our director for Novus Global Sports. So he work is, he, he work is, he <laughs> works with a, a bunch of, uh, pro professional athletes and, and runs a team of coaches to work with professional athletes. And so th there's a nice swath here. And frankly, uh, Janet and Dan are, are in the saddle a lot more than I am. So I only have a handful of clients. Janet, Janet and Dan really are in this day in and day out. Cool. Uh, so with that being said, Janet, I'll kick it to you. How would you explain it to a defense? Yeah. Okay. So I would say um, as human beings, we all have a general intuitive sense of what's possible or not possible for us. Um, uh, however, that was formed, whether by uh, history, experience, family, um, uh, uh, education, we from, uh, honestly, from moment to moment have different um, kind of a general sense of what we think is, is possible. And so oftentimes when we're working with someone, we start by asking them what they want to create, what, what is the ROI for them? What's their vision? And uh, one of my favorite things is helping people pick something that's outside that intuitive sense. Cause oftentimes we underestimate what we're capable of. So we'll pick something that we think we can achieve. So we avoid any emotional pain, yeah. uh, but that's not the, that's not what we're going after. Um, our goal is not only to help people hit um, their vision, their dream, their goal, but to help them grow or transform or to reinvent themselves on the way there. So uh, how's that? Uh, that was great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, one, Kirk, how was that for you? Uh, that was great for me. I, I know very little about any of this stuff, so you could have said anything there. I'd have been like, that's cool. Well, I, the, 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 one, the one key factor to uh, and the one key motivator that keeps the fence, our fences um, robust is, is uh, the experience of fear. So fear, fear is really the determining factor for where you put your fence, not, not facts, not reality, not what you can keep. So one of the things that... Um, we, we want to pay attention to as coaches uh, that we do at Novus Global, I think very, really well is to slow down and pay attention to where fear uh, is, is holding you from a conversation that you long to have that would expand your life in a way that would thrill you that you're not giving yourself permission to even entertain. Yeah. 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 And I know, I know Kirk, you asked in the, in the pregame stuff, you know, what's a good coach. Yeah. And what we might say is a, a good coach is going to help you figure out what you want and then help you get it. Uh, a great coach, which was what we're more interested in at the firm. We're not really interested in being good coaches. We want yeah. to be the best coaches on the earth, the face of the earth. Right. So a good coach is going to help you get what you want. A great coach is going to help you expand what you want. Yeah. yeah. And I have to believe there's some adversarial. First off, you're dealing with a, with a group of people through price point and through who you're targeting that are spending a lot of money that they earn because they're mainly like go getter type people for the most part, they're going to, you know, and then, therefore they probably have a lot of, uh, I don't mean this in a negative sense, but they have a, an ego to that extent. You need to be very confident to find yourself in those positions. So I imagine that results in a lot of adversarial conversations with y'all. Or do they, do they take mean, your advice or do they get, do they get mad? I guess that's, kind of, that's kind of what I meant. <laughs> it isn't even advice that you're giving. Well, it's crazy. So, you know, I've been coached by both Janet and Dan in various times in my career. Um, uh, and I would say it's amazing what people can say to you when you trust that they're advocating for your best life. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> one time I was working with a client and he made a joke. He said, you know, if my wife walked in on us right now, we're is virtual, but he's like, if my wife walked into my office right now, uh, she would think that you're abusing me. And he meant it as a joke. And I was like, I said, why is that? He says, you, because you say things to me that I, I would never let anyone get away with saying, but he's like, when you say it, I know that you're trying to help me when other people say it, I know that they, or it feels like they're trying to hurt me. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's a big part of it, uh, Kirk, is it's about, 
it really is about building a, a container of advocacy with, uh, with folks. So where you can really lean in hard and look, I'm not their dad. We're not, you know, we're, we're, we, we, we have no, we have no coercive power. Right. So, <laughs> so we, we just, and it's nice to have people in your life who, who will come at you with fierce advocacy, um, who, who have, who also have no coercive power. You know, it's a, it's a very, if you, if you t tell me to go to hell, who, I'll, great, I'll see you next week. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, no repercussion. Know, you, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you do that with your spouse or with other people on your team that could really burn bridges. And so it's nice to have someone who's safe to wrestle with. Yeah. Um, and, and there's a lot of power in that. Well, so the to, same, go ahead, go ahead, Dan. Record, at yeah. the same time, um, you should know that we, we, this type of work we do in prisons with high school students, with inner city uh, uh, nonprofits, so it's not a, um, and that's something that we strongly believe in. Generosity is something that we're we're committed to, and yeah. making this type of work accessible to all. And um, uh, you'll be surprised how much of an ego you can find in a 14 year old kid. Uh, <laughs> and it might it might not be all that different from the ego you find in one of the world's best athletes. Um, right. Yeah, I imagine you're you're having a stable of, and stable is the wrong word to use, but have, having a client, a book of of clients who are all. Uh, elite athletes. I imagine that your day-to-day -day conversations, uh, I'm sure that foundationally they're similar, but they have to vary in tone, I would imagine. Yeah, each, each. Uh, I had a call this morning with a guy who's in the Stanley Cup final uh, with the Avalanche, Colorado Avalanche, and um, uh, he is a completely different uh, type of conversation than the other guy I was talking to who was playing against him in the, the round right before it in the, in, in the, in the NHL playoffs. Yeah. Uh, and, and so each each person and, and, and what we spend a lot of time doing is um, paying attention to what others uh, take for granted or what we don't pay attention to. Um, uh, and I say this often when I'm talking to clients, like we, we are often listening to what people are saying in our normal conversations. What we're trained to do is pay attention to how you're saying it at a level that most people aren't even aware is possible, but it's all there. All that, all that data is there. And each person they have different things that are going on in their life, different conversations in their heads that they're paying attention to that are guiding their behavior towards things they don't want to achieve or things they do want to achieve. And it's about really slowing that down. So in an athletic space, what's fun is it's instantaneous. You can have a conversation, go perform and see if it worked within 12 hours. And so um, uh, that's, that's a really, uh, uh, some, some might not be up for that level of accountability. <laughs> yeah. It's a little bit too reactive for some probably. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I imagine from what you're all saying, it's clear that trust is obviously the key part of this relationship as it is with any relationship. And particularly when you're dealing with, with aggressive folks, how, what, what are some methods other than probably just, tr I, what are some methods? How do you, how do you earn trust in a way that they can, that you can get to the point where you're telling them something that if their husband or wife said it to them, they'd be furious, you know? You, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kick that to Janet because Janet, we joke is there's a, there's a specific, there's kind of an A type strong, uh, what I would call annoying uh, type of type of leader <laughs> yeah. that, 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 um, that are necessary as you build teams, but sometimes I don't always enjoy uh, being around being them. around them as much. Yeah. yeah. And Janet just has, she's just very good at working with, with those types of, of leaders. I was waiting Janet, for you to say that Janet was that type of leader. <laughs> <laughs> Never. She, and, and, yeah, and, and, uh, and Janet, is one of those people, which is why I never uh, hang out when, when her and her husband are hosting, but um, the, no, Janet, you are good at that. And mm -hmm. how, how do you, how do you work with folks like that who are a little more type A, a little more aggressive, a little more um, overt in, in how they express their power in relationships? Yeah. Well, a, a couple different things are popping up in my head. One is um, connecting them to a vision that they truly care about. If they don't, they aren't clear about what they're going after then anything I say, any questions I ask, uh, they're likely to interpret it as adversarial. Um, so sometimes it does take time. I, I remember one particular client, it was three, four months of working together uh, and I'm, I'm treading lightly, uh, <laughs> not a, um, differently than maybe say another client who I could dive in pretty quickly. Right. Uh, treading lightly, just building that trust, building that rapport and making sure that they are clear that I am not here to tell them what to do. Yeah. Um, because oftentimes they'll just uh, live a lot of their lives conning everyone around them, conning themselves 
um, so that they feel like they're making movement. And so, um, the, so the first thing is connecting them to a vision that is worth hearing feedback that they might not want to want to hear. Yeah. Um, mm. I think that's the biggest thing. Yeah. And then how do you, so you identify that through just through questioning, basically your first your early conversations are all just getting to know what they're, what they're really into and what makes them tick kind of. Yeah. I'm specifically thinking of two, two individuals. Uh, and it's interesting sat around them recently, both of them telling the story of how they chose their coach and mm -hmm. both of them, it was both, it was, I was laughing at this because they're both the same exact personality type. I experienced them very similarly. And they both interviewed three or four other coaches before they, they met me. Mm -hmm. And they said, what I liked was that um, the other people I talked to, those smart, they all were consulting me. They called themselves coaches, but they were telling, they were giving me strategy advice, um, mm -hmm. which was great. And ironically, they were so resourceful. They just took the strategy advice they got in the first session yeah, and went, went and implemented it. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. um, and I was pretty clear with both of them. I don't remember this, but they, they just reminded me of it recently. Um, I was very clear. Hey, I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm, I'm here to help you reinvent the way that you think, the way that you operate so that you can actually begin to expand on all levels of your life to, to really create results that you're excited about. Right. Um, so they reminded me of that recently, that that was why uh, they chose, they chose me as their coach. So. Well, Jason, as the, I, I believe you're the, are you the founding, are you the founding member of Novus or a founding member or. Yeah, I'm for sure. a founding member. So you, that must make your heart, you must, your heart must feel good to hear that all the things you're probably looking for in a coach is exactly why she was ultimately selected in those cases. Yeah, yeah yeah i mean there's lots of things that janet and dan do that make my heart feel big uh the, the it's fun it's fun to it's fun to win with your friends yeah you know and i've known i've known both janet and dan and m many many other people in the firm as well uh, i've known them for decades you know and you know amanda who's one of our top performing coaches she's my biological sister she's okay. my older sister yeah. you know and so there is a degree of when we when we, we win together we lose together and we get frustrated with each other sometimes and, and we have, we forgive each other. And, and it's just, uh, we, and we practice what we preach, you know, like this is all the tools that we, we use with our clients, we use with and among ourselves. Yeah. And I think that gives us this, speaking of trust, I think that gives us a sense of, um, of authority, knowing that we're not coming from on high, we're coming alongside of, right. and, and we're, we're using the tools too, you know? And, and so it, it's a, there's a, there's a beauty and an, an authenticity that goes with that. Yeah. I imagine you're, you're all coaches. So you're all believing in the material that you're, that you're teaching. And, and, you know, so I, I, it would be, it would be really terrible to hear that you have a really rough uh, hostile work environment or something. It'd be a very negative <laughs> well, ad for your, for your business. Yeah. You know? Well, you know, hostile for some, I don't know. The, the, <laughs> we're pretty, we're, we always have room to grow on how I think we advocate for each other. I think if John Roberts, another one of our top coaches on the call, he'd, he, he be, want, want us to not be romantic about how well we always practice the tools perfectly. We got, yeah. we certainly have room, room to grow. One, one thing though, Kirk about trust is, uh, I, there are a lot of ways, there are healthy ways to earn trust and unhealthy ways to earn trust. So I think some people may trust the, the modus operandi, the bullseye of, of this deal. And I want to true, I want to, I want to be trusted, but more than that, when I work with clients, but more than that, I want to be trusted for specific reasons. Mm. I don't, I don't want to be trust because you can earn trust by telling people what they want to hear. Right. You can earn trust. There are a lot of like odious ways to earn trust. And just because someone, just because you've earned someone's trust doesn't mean you're trustworthy. And just because you're trustworthy doesn't mean that you're trustworthy in the ways that they need to trust you in order to really create something powerful with them. And so one of the things that we like to say is that I like to say, I don't, I don't, I don't know. So Janet and Dan don't have to love this. <laughs> Uh, but I, I think this, I think this resonates with our stuff. And uh, sometimes when I'm meeting new clients, I'll say, Hey, I want to explain who the boss is in this relationship. And oftentimes they think I'm powering up and they're like, they're going to they think I'm going to say I'm the boss. Yeah, yeah. And I said, just, just be really clear. I'm not the boss. And then they feel you know sometimes good about that. Cause that means that they're the boss. Yes, finally, there's only I'm two like, of us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you're not the boss either. <laughs> I said, so I'm not the boss. You're not the boss. Uh, your potential is the boss. And so, so long as you and I are submitting to your potential, this is going to be fine. Yeah. And I think there's something about that that instantly tells the other person, oh, this person, this coach isn't trying to use me. This coach isn't trying to monetize me. I think about Dan and how he earns trust with the athletes so quickly. It's because Dan doesn't care whether the client likes him or not. Dan cares a lot about whether the client succeeds or not. And uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's something that you cannot fake. Right. 
so how do you get such an authentic interest, Dan, in, in, in that? I mean, because eventually it is a job to some extent. So how do you keep it from becoming just another client? I, I think, I think um, <clears throat> two, two things. One is, and, I, and, and you said something interesting and I, I noticed it. You said, you know, I'm sure you guys believe in what you do. And, and a lot of people believe in what they do, but a lot of people don't practice their beliefs. Yeah. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So in, in our context, um, I think the reason why um, there's, there's a couple of elements and actually Jason and, and Janet probably have a better answer about me than I do about myself because they've been around me for so long. But I, I think, I think it's a commitment to doing work on myself and being honest with myself around, um, my own thoughts and what, what my agenda is. And the moment the agenda becomes something other than serving that person, um, and serving their success, there's a very quick admission of that. There's not a hiding of it. There's almost a, a nature of getting that onto the table so we can get rid of it or, or deal with it. And that's something we do both as coaches for ourselves, but also with our clients. And, and then there's another thing too, is, is, um, I, I, uh, um, this sounds kind of strange, uh, being a professional athlete or being a C-suite executive of a large company is an incredibly lonely job. Right. Um, and, and, and what's funny is I think all of us as human beings experience loneliness but there's almost a cultural conversation that if you're in certain positions of success, you're not allowed to suffer or have any sort of lonely experience. In right. fact, you, and in fact, you're not allowed even to talk about it. And one of the things that I've, I've experienced that in my own life personally. Um, mm -hmm. And so one of the things that's been pretty powerful is to connect to the human being in front of me rather than the position or the, the, the persona of this person. And I, I took, I had, I had dinner with them. Um, I took two of my clients out for dinner. Both are very well recognizable people. So yeah. went to a restaurant and I noticed that within me, this, uh, cause we were being accosted at dinner by a, a lot of people wanting things from these two guys. And uh, it was fascinating that I noticed internally my desire to protect them. Um, right. uh, and, and was, and they were fine with it. They were like, that's their life, right? That's normal. Yeah. Yeah. But what I noticed is like, oh, that's an interesting, I didn't. And it was a, it was a good conversation, but it was just, oh, that's an interesting noticing like, uh, as a coach, my job is to ensure that I'm looking and talking to this person as a person, uh, recognizing their talent, but seeing them as a human first and then, yeah. and then going from there. So, but I, I'm sure Jason and Janet have a different answer. It's probably more, more in profound. Well, I like when it. I think about both of you <clears throat> with Dan, so every coach is going to bring their temperament, their personality, their, maybe their wiring, but certainly their habitual way of being into the conversation. And in some ways it's like work what your mama gave you, you know? Yeah, so yeah. like at the, in, at the Institute, we really try hard to train people. Of course, there's like a standard way that we serve everyone that you can expect if you hire someone from our world, if it's certified at the Institute or in our firm, there's going to be uh, similarities there. Right. Uh, but then we, re we really work hard to, to help people use their, their uniqueness and their passions mm -hmm. to, to, to serve clients in a unique way. And so I would I would say like Dan, one of the things I really admire and want to grow in with my clients when I look at Dan is he, and I, I'm sure his family has mixed feelings about this, but he, he really, he goes all in. Like there is this, there is this immense accessibility that Dan creates with his clients where they're texting him at nine o'clock, 10 o'clock at night after a game. And, you know, my, my clients generally almost never text me uh, yeah. hardly ever. So he's really done this great, building this real, real outside the confines of the, the mechanistic, you know, a few times a month coaching sessions thing yeah. that I think is a huge value add. And, and not everybody, Dan's also loves being around people all the time. <laughs> and, you know, I, I really, really, really enjoy my alone time. So that necessarily, <laughs> there'd be a trade off there. But then, and then when I look at Janet, Janet, one of the things I really admire about Janet, I've never, I've never experienced Janet as desperate in my life. No, she, she, she has this fantastic, um, warm, it's warm, mm -hmm. but warm detachment Yes. to where you, you, you can trust that she's not conning you. You can trust that she's, you know, so like I'll watch her in training. So we'll be like working with some, you know, multi-billion dollar company in New York city and she's doing this training and someone will say something. And my instinct will like a Labrador try to like wag my tail and yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. And then she'll just calmly disrupt whatever, you know, con that they're running. And, and if I would have said it, I would have come across like a jerk, but she can say it. And there's this, there's a kindness 
and a, and a fierceness, almost like a velvet sword, you know, like yeah. it, it's, she, she, you know, she could, she could walk by you and say, if you come, it's like shiv, shiv, shiv. And you're, and you want, you, you want to hug her, but you're bleeding and you're not sure quite where that <laughs> yeah, came well, from. <laughs> it's I've, I've learned, and, and I'm so glad you pointed it out, uh, Jay, cause um, I've learned a lot uh, from Janet watching Janet. In fact, I brought that. And, and that's one of the power uh, powers that we have as a community of coaches that I think is missing out in the ether at, uh, if you're on your own, is is being able to watch other coaches and be influenced by them and learn from them. I, I like I Janet's detachment, Jason's ability to um, see beyond. Uh, that's that's uh, see beyond where a person is at into where they could go and call them forward into that. Uh, and you probably heard that when you were talking to Jeff as yeah. well. Um, there's there's these 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 parts of of us that are unique to us, but can also be shared and learned from. And so I've, I've been so thankful. And just so you're aware, when Jason started this whole thing, um, uh, it was really exciting, the thought of being around in a community of people, not only where you could get better yourself, but you could also really grow because of the people you're around and catch what they've got a little bit. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I feel that it hits close to home to me for sure. I mean, this, this conversation is a perfect example of why I wanted to do the podcast. It's really a hobby thing. And I had been in a, in a role where I felt super lonely because I was working for the ownership family and they, we didn't really see eye to eye and ethically and things like that. And then who could I talk to, you know, cause then you're a rabble rouser if you try to have that conversation internally. And I certainly yeah. can't talk to people that I want to like vent about, <laughs> you know? And so I, I got that. And that's really the, what kind of led to the, the start of this podcast was I wanted to learn. I, I was sick of being around people that I couldn't learn from very much anymore, mm. you know? And mm. so like this opportunity, even when it's from someone from a completely different walk of life, maybe even especially from those folks, like the, the type of learning that can be had just through conversation is incredible. Mm. And you, that's yeah. what you're all, are, that's what you're all are doing on a day to day. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's fun. And just so you know, so notice, Kirk, if, if people are watching this on YouTube, you can see me and Dan laugh and smile while you're saying that. And then I'm watching Janet's face and she's just, she's hearing all your crap, man. <laughs> Is it crap? <laughs> I, I want to hear it. I want to hear it. Is it crap? Let's hear it. I, I don't know if it's crap yet. I'm just collecting data. <laughs> okay. okay. We're, you got you to be I careful. I am bleeding. I feel like coaches. I'm bleeding. There's <laughs> that. Uh, it's just, and not, and you, we can go there if you I want. Go, and you, 100% you know, I want to go. I 100 want to go there. Yeah, yeah. I kind of and I'm and I'm, I'm putting Jana a little bit on the spot, yeah. but uh, I didn't but, have it. Sometimes it's just my face. No, I was listening. <laughs> sometimes and, it's just my face. <laughs> and I, I, just to speak to that, like yes, maybe I'm noticing something. I I think there is something to not affirming uh, um, people's. Um, kind of complaints necessarily and we can empathize like I I absolutely empathize uh with my clients and I think that uh holding the tension is really important between like being with and allowing people to feel heard and sometimes that that in and of itself is powerful for the people we work with is yeah. they have no one to express some of these things to um mm -hmm. and my job is not to get enrolled into into my client's stories and right. what they're choosing to believe and how what they think their limitations are yeah uh but yeah, I, I don't, I don't have enough uh, data yet. <laughs> I gather that Jason must, Jason hears some bullshit in there. He I, must. I heard some things too. <laughs> oh, for heard, sure. And, heard... and, and yeah, Janet did too. She's being polite because we don't have permission yet. And... <laughs> Wait, time out, time out. You, it's full bore out from here on out. And from even from the beginning, it, I, it's all on the open. I think it'd be more valuable Perfect. to everyone to hear me get some shit, I think. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. We, we, you know, we, we say sometimes, I'm trying to think of a more PC way of saying this for, for public consumption, but when we train coaches, we'll say, uh, coaching, coaching is a lot. I'm going to put it this way. I don't usually say it this way, but I'll say coaching is a lot like kissing somebody. It goes a lot better if you have permission. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And so you, you, you want to get consent yes, uh, before. And so as we're, as we're listening, but I, I might say, uh, Jana did an eloquent way of saying that maybe in a parallel track to that is w part of being trained as a coach is learning how to hear the ways that we unintentionally diminish our own lives as we talk about our mm, lives. Mm -hmm. And so my guess is, Kirk, you wouldn't be shocked that when you articulated that little journey into the podcast world, there might there might be some elements of self diminishment. Yeah, like calling there. it a hobby. Yeah, calling it a hobby. Yeah. So even some of the reasons why you did it uh, would be interesting. Yeah. And Janet didn't take the bait, and I'm really proud of her because you know five ten minutes ago we talked about you want to attach coaching to somebody's vision, and right now we, we wouldn't just like lay into you in terms of what we heard because we don't know what you want yet. Yeah. 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 You know, and not just one in terms of give it to me because coaching isn't masochism, you right. know, it's, yeah. 
it's not what one time, not to keep talking too much, but one time I was interviewing a client and, uh, to see if I wanted to work with him and if he wanted to work with me and he got on, he was really proud of himself. And I was, I was proud of him too. He got on, he said, Jason, I want you to show me all my blind spots. <laughs> and, um, I said, no. <laughs> and, and he's like, what? And he, he laughed. He's like, why? And I said, uh, well, first of all, that would take forever. I mean, you've got tons of them. You have to live with them said, for 40 years, <laughs> document everything. Yeah. 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 And I said, secondly, not all blind spots matter. You know, like I said, look, like he was in Atlanta at the time. He was in a little office in, in, in Atlanta. We're Zooming. And I said, like, right now, can you see the Eiffel Tower? And he's like, no, like I'm in Atlanta. And I was like, yeah, great. So you're blind to the Eiffel Tower. Yeah. I said, does that have any consequence to your life at all? He's like, no. He's like, yeah, because like you're not trying to get to Paris. Right. Like you don't you don't care. You know, so we only really want to deal with the blind spots that are keeping you from getting where you want to go. Yeah. And so the, the reason why Janet didn't jump in with the red meat is because she doesn't know where you want to go yet. So she'd want to have a conversation with you first, figuring out where do you want what, what what's inside of you? Where do you want to go? What are your hopes or your dreams? What what's something that would make you weep with awe oh, if mean, you were able to create that? I, right. I can, do you want me to just proffer that right up? I can do that. Okay. Yeah. Oh, all right. So, I mean, Let's do I, it. I, I 100 have a vision. I called it a hobby. You're right. That is dimin self diminishing. I, I as soon as I said it, I thought maybe you'd say that. Uh, <laughs> but but it started as that. But I absolutely am motivated. I, I my real goal, which isn't super quantifiable, is I'd like to be able to just do this as a self sustaining. This is what is what I do. You know, right now I'm I'm, yeah. I'm su supplementing this right now with I have my own su uh, sales firm that I have a, a major client with. That's really how I'm surviving. My wife's an attorney, but I would love to be able to just do this. And to me, that's, that's kind of not like a, that's within my intuitive fence. Right. So if I, if I was trying to put one out there more, I want to be a top, I want to be a guy making a million dollars a year through media creation. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I, not that I'm motivated by money, but it's some, it's an, it's a scoreboard, I guess. So that's, is that yeah. close enough? Is, is that still too murky? <laughs> not, not murky. It's, it's great. And it's, and it's a good start. And I love that you even already identified what's inside your fence yeah. in the realm of possibility and what's outside uh so that's great so the million dollars that's kind of uh, within my you, fence you just, though i don't know oh, I mean, you know what i'm okay. saying i just want to make it you, <laughs> you, you get what i'm where i'm going yeah you might have to help yeah, me identify yeah. what my real vision is maybe hey i love well, it jason what do you have a thought well that's worth noticing so even yeah. even kirk just notice sometimes we 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 live with a with even an intuition that we think we know what game we're trying to win but it's 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 foggy it's fuzzy it's 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 it's, it's an ether you know it's a mist yeah. and and again it's, in some ways I'm, I'm i guess quote saving janet from having to like coach in real time because we you know um but I'll, I'll i can get off of that i don't know what oh, why all of a sudden i turn into a big brother <laughs> the, <laughs> it's like dan at dinner the, the other uh, night yeah yeah no kidding <laughs> but there is when we when we train when we train coaches i don't know if you ever saw the patriot it was kind of a rip off of braveheart um, but there's a, uh, it was Braveheart, just in a different was, decade, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, different time period. I feel like I feel like Gladiator and the Patriot are both diminished. Uh, speaking of diminished language, dim diminished narratives of of, of Braveheart. Uh, but there's a quote in that says, "Aim small, miss small." Yeah. And so part of getting clear on vision is helping people get. Clear. First of all, most people think they have a vision and they don't. They have an impression. And it's not the same. Thing. How do you differentiate the and, two? Yeah. So an impression is like, well, you know, like impressionistic art. Yeah. You know, like if you look at a Picasso, it's like, I think I see a woman, uh, <laughs> that, that could be, that could be anything, <laughs> you know? Right. And, and, and just to give you a quiz, Kirk, like why might you, why might you keep your vision vague versus getting specific about it? Yeah. Cause I'm probably afraid not to hit it. I mean, realistically yeah. at the root of it probably. Right. Yeah. So the more vague someone's vision is, the the more I, the more I can know in some way that they're not really up to that yet. Yeah, I hear you. So it's it's um, not, well, just to uh, add to that, it's still living in the kind of want, interested in category, versus the putting the stake in the ground. Hey, by next year, I want to uh, be able to quit my job. Uh, I want this much in revenue. I want, uh, and we could, you could add a ton of details there, but there's often a reason why probably 99% of the people that I talk to the very first conversation, they're pretty vague. Um, they, they have a sense or a desire for something, but there's usually a strategy around keeping something vague. Yeah. Um, how do I mean, how do you three and all your colleagues and your network of coaches, how do you, do you, do you find yourself 
vic- falling victim to these same trappings? Hundred percent, a thousand percent. We're doing it. Oh all yeah. The time. Like I, I think that's the key. The key is there are no haves or have nots in this this type of work. And nobody's mm-hmm. nobody's excused from the table. Um, and right now, Jason, Janet, myself are all underestimating what we're capable of. We're all doing it right now. Yes. Yeah. And so that one of the things that, um, and that's that's what's so uh, exhilarating and terrifying sometimes about being in a community that's committed to a constant. Uh, re-examination of that conversation because there's a, a right now my life uh, five years ago if you told me I would be doing what I'm doing now in my life I would have laughed in your face I would have thought <laughs> it was the most ridiculous outlandish thing uh, you could ever claim and what's strange is if if I keep playing the game if I'm committed to the game that'll be true in five years about right now for right. there right and so mm-hmm. that's that's um but but vagueness in the conversation is a way to almost have a conversation like it's it's a way of faking feeling, a conversation feeling it out almost to see how the reaction is or something yeah or not or, or or like flirt it's like flirting with going on an, an app to to find a date it's like it's it's you're not even you're not even in the game but you kind of think you are and so uh, uh and that's that's a real and it's one of the ways we do that and i do that with my i have three kids i do that with my parenting i do that with you know, um, not, it's not just a business or a goals uh, around ROI or how much revenue you want to make. Right. Um, but if we were, if we continue to dig, uh, not only would we want to get really specific about the outcome, but also the meaning underneath it that you give it. It's like, why does that matter to you? Um, because there's, there's probably some very powerful values, motivating things mm-hmm. that if you get really connected to could drive you forward with a lot of energy you didn't know you had. Yeah. I hear, yeah, these, this is all really nice advice. I mean, I feel like, is, is there any more coaching you can do to me given the, the state, the stage <laughs> of my vision or do I need to dive back in and try and, and try and do a live here? I'm, my, my, my sense, I think I'm noticing my sense is that it might, the, the truth is if you watched a recording of a, of a coaching call, uh, although interesting, it can, it, there's, there's time, it's like, there's time, there's, it's, because there's thinking, there's there's you wrestling, and uh, I think I I'm slightly feeling insecure that it might not be that interesting for the audience, although extremely valuable for you. And uh, <laughs> yeah, obviously, yeah. we would uh, we would be happy to schedule a, a call outside of this because that's what we do and that's what we love. Um, I'm with you. I'm really not trying to get a free session like... here. I'm not trying to get a free <laughs> session. I promise. Well, hey, hey, I wouldn't blame you for trying. Like that's yeah. a good that's a good move, man. Yeah, I actually set up the actual my real vision. I set up a whole podcast for just so I can get a free session from nobody. <laughs> that's a long game. No, I do appreciate what you're well, saying, that- and I, I can feel it, it really hits. Uh, it, it feels it's like being honest with yourself. You know, you get those times where you do that, well, and just to and, hear it from and, other people, it makes it feel less like depressive and less hard yeah. on yourself too. Because sometimes you we shy away from that because of. Uh, I generally have a positive disposition, but I can feel myself getting in negative thought patterns sometimes. So sometimes that anything that feels negative, you almost want to shy away from. So to hear it from three professional people, it just feels better. I don't know. And to have, and to, and and to give a little paint by numbers for people listening. So like they can go on this journey a little bit with you in terms of the conversation. One would be, I would want to know, what do you want specifically to happen in the next year that you're afraid to admit that you want? or that you're, you've written off as impossible, right? And, and not, not fantasy, like, well, unless, you know, like, I, I want to be living on Mars. It's like, okay, well, like, we could talk about that. But do you actually want that? You know, like, there's, there's a, you know, yeah. so there's, there's a, a, the next step, once you've got that clear, is to begin to look at um, some of the underlying uh, behaviors that would be required to get there. Like you could write that list out. Mm-hmm. And, and ultimately, I think it's important. I, I've, I've tried to change myself in isolation a lot. I have a very bad track record of that. Um, mm-hmm. I have a very good track, and I'm getting better, but I have a very good track record of, of transformation inside of community. And that's one of the reasons why I've had a coach for over a decade, and mm-hmm. I will have a coach till I die. Um, because mm-hmm. uh, it's constantly, I'm up-leveling what I'm using my coach for uh, in, in the coaching space. But I think if you can get if you can get started with getting really clear about what you want that maybe you've given up on and yeah. what kind of person or what kind of behaviors would be required to get there, that'll get the wheels turning. So when you show up to have a conversation with any coach, whether it's our company or somebody else, um, somebody good, hopefully the restaurant serves decent food, right? Yeah. You, you, can, you can get some traction. You can get a little bit more traction a little more quickly. 
Yeah, I like that. I appreciate that. I like that. Yeah, I think what, what about what are some major kind of challenges? Obviously, not not specifically with who the client is, or whatever. But like, do you, what are some success stories that you think would be of value to the audience too? Of like things that you saw a client realize that maybe for the first time you saw come to fruition, and and maybe how could we identify similar learning opportunities in our own lives? I guess. I that goes out to anyone that wants to jump in. <laughs> I mean, Janet and Dan these days have better stories than I do. <laughs> Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. I'm just, I'm, my mind's, uh, I, I, I got one. Yeah. Yeah. One. Okay. I can jump yeah. and Janet, you can think, um, okay, I'm going to think for a second. There's a couple like in the sports space, um, performance and results, uh, well, what's ironic or what's paradoxical about that is the more an athlete gets fixated on a particular result, uh, it actually creates a lot of diminishing returns with their performance self. Um, so, uh, if, if, if all, if all a player is thinking about is I need to look good and I need to score, or I need to get points or whatever it is, um, it actually inhibits their ability often to, to perform. So one of the, one of the things that, um, I'm thinking of one guy in particular, he had a, uh, he was a young player that I worked with. This is many years ago, actually. And he, he had a horrible season, just dismal season, mm-hmm. um, because he was constantly saying to himself, you're not doing enough. You're not doing enough. You're not doing enough. You need to be better. You need to be better. Like this, it was on like almost a, a loop in his mind. Right. So we, we started talking, we disrupted that we created, we examined that we dug into that. And then the following season, um, he went from, I think he had like three points or something in that first season of the sport he played the following season at over 60. Um, and, and he enjoyed his life. He got better. Like his satisfaction went up, his productivity went up. Um, simply because he began to realize the thing he was paying attention to was actually not the thing that was going to help him perform. It was the thing that was giving him a sense of control, mm. not, not actually fueling performance. So I, I could probably tell a thousand versions of that story. Right. Um, uh, but that's one example. Another quick one is um, uh, a guy who I could t- public, publicly talk about. Uh, we've had him on our podcast. His name's Luke Shen. He was on the verge of uh, retirement. He was playing in the minor leagues of hockey. Uh, he thought his career was over. Um, and fortunately, we got on a call about a month before the bubble, the COVID bubble playoffs started. And he was asked to go in with his team, but he was going to be the ninth defenseman, which means he wasn't going to play. Right. And we had a very clear conversation around what he wanted. Like, what did you, uh, very similar to what we talked about earlier, what he actually wanted. He had just had a child. He was really torn with whether or not he goes in. He ended up going into the bubble, kind of holding to his vision, going into the bubble, playing his way back into the lineup. And then eventually his team won that uh, Stanley Cup that year. Then he won again the following year. Uh, wow, cool. and, and actually the story continues. He just keeps continuing to achieve things that he thought that in a moment of emotional um, uh, confusion or frustration could have walked away from. And if you ask him, he'll tell you, like the reason that happened was because of that conversation and making that decision. That's another story. And, and so, so what was the, the conversation specifically was what, just to, re, to realign, to reconsider and realign what your actual goals are at that point? It, it, was, it was to get extremely sober about what the options were in front of him and what the risks were and what the costs and benefits might be. Okay. Most people don't do that. They, they, they don't make decisions. Um, they do not make decisions in ways that are reflective. They, 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 they make them in terms of reactive. Right. Uh, in a reaction sort of, of way. So there's a lot of details that I left out in terms of that conversation that, that are private, but, but that's the gist of the conversation yeah. that we have. And even, and I'm going to kick it to Janet here in a second, as if it were my podcast. Sorry. It, I, Sorry I, love it. I love it. I love it. Good. <laughs> but um, before, before I do, it's a, there's a, uh, what most people don't realize. So like right now I'm having an experience and I'm completely unaware of how my, my, my fear and my belief system is muting, dampening, or focusing my experience. So I think my experience is reality, but my experience is just a small glimpse of reality. Right. And part of what coaching does is it, is it shifts your consciousness. It shifts your mind. It shifts your perception of reality to where things that never occurred to you as possible suddenly become possible and not only possible, but easy, you know, so that the, the getting clear on vision is a mechanism we use to help people shift the way, not just, not just the way that they show up three times a month for 45 minutes during a coaching session, right. but to, it's almost like smelling salts to awaken a person up to the clarity of life. And then with, when they walk alongside a coach, they, they get the wake up 
which is kind of what Dan was describing earlier. But then also they, they, they get the, the partner for the journey of staying crisp and staying clear and yes. staying sober to what they're up to in a way that, that allows them more likely to accomplish things than ever thought that they could. As an example, Jenny, you want to tell your story? Yeah, well, I was just thinking of uh, one particular client that I worked with, and after three months, he's a very talented creative consultant. He's worked, partnered with Nike, um, and this was one of those one conversation uh, stories where we had one conversation, I think it was about two and a half to three months in, uh, it launched him into creating two clients equaling seventy thousand uh, dollars. It, it just within that those first three months, so yeah. uh, it had well uh, covered the cost of coaching. Uh, and there's there's a few of those. Sometimes it's long term, sometimes it's short term. I've had a company who's also tripled their revenue in six six months. A small creative agency um, really launched them. And I also have stories of um, people who uh, are thriving in relationships. That so just happens to be a passion of mine as well. Um, and for some reason I have three clients right now that are pregnant and I'm, I'm trying to figure out uh, what the connection is there. <laughs> <laughs> if, if that were a good thing, good th if Jason and Dan had that on their hands, it'd be a lot more examined. There'd have to be a lot more examination. Yeah. Yeah. That's well, yes, yeah. that's true. I, as long as you have consent. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I, individual care. We, yeah. there, well, there, we can there cut is... that out if we need to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I thought it was. Yeah, that's it, that, is a, that, that is that is that is a joke. That is that is that is, that is, that is a that is just just there there, there is there is something and, and Jason I think articulated it really really powerfully in terms of um, we don't know we don't we think we know what's running our lives. Uh, we think we know what conversations or what thoughts are running our lives. Um, uh, but we're so good as individuals at conning ourselves. We're, yeah. we're incredibly good. And, but we're not very good at conning other people in the way we con ourselves. Like, we, everyone kind of knows that when they're listening to their friends talk, mm -hmm. they don't ever say it, but they're like, this guy's full of crap. Like, like, you know, and it's, and it's uh, coaching is, is, um, is an up, like a, a much higher level version of what I just described. But I, I can think of a couple different, I remember one client, Janet, your story reminded me of one, this is like five, six years ago, where uh, I started working with this client, she worked for an oil and gas company and, and asked her what she wanted. And she said, well, I want to raise. And I said, have you ever asked for one? And she said, no. And I said, okay, well, that's interesting. And she, that week went and asked for a raise and got a $20,000 raise <laughs> in the first, in the first few. And, and that's not necessarily always typical, but it, it, yeah. it was hilarious. It's almost comical that, a lot of the time, what we want to create, even what we want, we need to expand that. We talk about that a lot. But even the things we want, we have done very little investigation as to whether or not we could create it, even within the next two hours. And so right. that's yeah. that's something that coaching, um, that's one of the ways that coaching transformed my life. I remember writing down my coach, my first coach asked me, what, what am I tolerating in my life? And I wrote, my house is too small. And in my mind, I literally thought moving was impossible. Like we couldn't buy a larger home and yeah. it was it. But I hadn't asked the mortgage broker. I hadn't looked at her bank statements. I hadn't looked at really. And all of a sudden, six months later, we're in a new house. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, so it's really it's, just sometimes one question like that is all it takes. Exactly. It's a shocking, it's shocking how we hide yeah. things in the fog uh, as, as human yeah. beings. And we, we, uh, we play chess against ourselves, you know, so sometimes one of the one of the few dogmatic statements we have in our community on the firm and the institute we say healthy people ask for what they want and what's interesting is i i just go about my life assuming i can't have what i want and then what happens is instead of testing that theory i just i i don't even ask right. you know and that's everybody you know everybody walks around wanting things that they haven't asked for and what's interesting about that is I can talk to my guy friends and girlfriends about that. I can have, a, I, I can let my hair down and have a drink with somebody and talk about how I, I'm not getting, let's say with Dan's example, how I'm not getting a raise. Right. And that conversation nine times out of 10 is going to veer into, well, that's because they don't appreciate you. And Resentment. that's because, yeah, that's because they, you know, your boss sucks and you're getting support. Yeah. You believe. get a bunch of support for the BS kind of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You get, you get a co-conspirator in the diminished life and we call that friendship. Mm -hmm. And so what's beautiful about a coach is they're professionally trained. And this is, this is what Janet was doing by what I call her, like the warm detachment is she's really good at not becoming a co-conspirator, which at first can feel a little uncomfortable because you're like, why is she not buying into my yeah. story? In fact, we, we, we would call that, why is she being a bad listener? Why is she not being empathetic towards mm -hmm. me? Why? And, and one of our colleagues, her name is Jean Marie. She taught me a phrase called empathy extortion, where, where this, so Kirk, this, these are the rules. You're going to talk about, 
how hard it is, you know, uh, with your job and, and yeah. wanting to start a podcast and having a hobby. And our job is to be like, oh, that sounds really hard. I'm so sorry. And that sounds really tough. And that's, that's being a good friend, but it's being a horrible coach. Right. And you, you can, you can over, I didn't know this, by the way, did you know that you can overdose on water? I, I've heard that. I didn't know. I thought that was just a, an old wives tale, honestly. No, it's true. No, no, no. I, there's a, there's a friend of mine, very successful businesswoman, sold a fashion company, never has to work a day in her life, hundreds of millions of dollars. And she sent me a picture a few years ago and she's in a hospital and she's got an oxygen mask over her face. And I'm like, Oh my God, what happened? Like I knew she was hiking that weekend. I thought maybe she yeah. dehydrated and she said, no, I overdosed. I'm like, she doesn't do drugs. She's straight as an arrow. Yeah. Like, what did you overdose on? She's like water. You can drink too much water and you can overdose almost on anything. And empathy is one of them. And, and again, we call that family. We call that friendship. We call that, we call that community. And it's really none of those things. It's actually mm -hmm. toxic and odious. And, and part of coaching is, uh, creating a healthy space for empathy to exist in, but also creating a space where disruption and advocacy and all these other things that are valuable can coexist in a way that moves a person's life forward. Because you know, you, you can either a have the the short term heroin hit of a person empathizing with your pain, or you can have the long term growth and uh, and progress and satisfaction and fulfillment that comes from actually creating the life that you want. And yeah. you know, it's. Kirk, it's your choice. You know, my, I mean, I, it's, it's, this whole dynamic is interesting because my, my wife is, I would say, a lot like you, right, Janet? So, like, she, she's an attorney. She, there are things that she says sometimes that I'm like, it, maybe it's because of how I built my own vision of who I am in my head or something. But, like, I generally try to be supportive and empathetic, which I realize at times is a, is a bad thing. But she, she won't allow it. <laughs> Like she'll, she'll hammer her, her friends and the, she doesn't have a huge group of friends as a result of that. But the ones that stick around her really trust her and she can tell them sure. the real talk and they know it's coming from a real place. So I've, she's definitely gotten me like more towards center on that, but it's still something I need to get better at for sure. But yeah. It, sure. It, yeah. Well, and we all have our, our things that are used as avoidance strategies, right? So even, even myself, you know, um, before I really learned a lot of these tools, uh, I wasn't fun to be around in my 20s <laughs> before I trained as a coach because I was chronically frustrated with uh, the people around me wondering why they didn't just take my advice. Like if they only did what I said, <laughs> their lives would be better. Right. Uh, and so I wasn't fun to be around. And so for me, the, the, the growth was one, um, understanding when that was one, not like asking for permission for one thing. Um, Two, having tools so that people felt advocated for and not, so it wasn't me coming at someone out with, with an entitled uh, uh, energy. Um, so really it's, I mean, my, my favorite uh, word is tensions, just the understanding how to hold both um, so that you uh, can love the people around you. So. Yes. You don't overdose on either. Yeah. yeah. And when you say hold tension, you mean like when someone's when there's a when there's a moment that's requiring some soul searching you don't give an, an easy hook or an easy way out basically is that yeah well and the, the tension of knowing okay this person is let's say i have a friend who's complaining and they're struggling and really pausing slowing down listening and understanding what they need um, and in fact, Jason and Amanda, his sister, talk a lot about how they'll communicate, uh, hey, this is a friend text, or this is a sibling text, or this is a coach text, uh, really knowing how to not just jump in just because I feel like I know what someone needs, um, which to me is really important, because oftentimes um, we love to give unsolicited advice as humans, and uh, most of the time that doesn't work. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And, and just to be clear, so Janet's talking about the tension of, say, empathy and advocacy, mm -hmm. right? You can, if you veer, you know, yeah. another word for tension is paradox. One of my favorite leadership quotes is leadership is the art of mastering paradox. So how can you be both at the same time? Or how can you leverage one to enhance the other? Yeah. And most people err towards one side or the other, and then they face predictable social challenges because well, of it especially right. in romantic relationships like uh, janet's husband and my wife are uh i would say similar people they're 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 helpers they're people who empathize really strongly janet and i are like tend to be fixers you know it's, when we're talking <laughs> to each other it's great because it's like what do i do oh i'll give you an answer right? like there's like a, yeah. and so what's what's and, and this and the work that we've done uh my wife's actually a, a part of our firm and a coach a, a talented coach in our firm as well which is that's an interesting relationship and you got two <laughs> coaches married each other but um <clears throat> but even with janet and ryan uh, her husband like there's a 
there's a, there is a navigating of, and this, this is really where the growth has come for me uh, over the last number of years is, am I paying attention to what is needed or am I paying attention to what I, what I want to be needed? Um, mm-hmm. And oh, those man, are two different things. Those so are very different things. Yeah, I'm guilty of that. <laughs> yeah, I have, an, I have an engineering background. So sometimes when someone presents me with a problem that they really probably just want to vent about, I'll tend to jump in with like ideas, solutions. And sometimes it's like, just gets worse and worse from there. You know, and I have a bad time of recognizing it until the other person's like over it. And I'm talking about my wife in a lot of cases. <laughs> <laughs> I love her to death, but I, I know. As, but I, as we are too. <laughs> yeah, so I, I guess what I'm, one thing I've been trying to be better is like just trying to be aware of that, but I still mm. trip on it all the time. You know, it's like. I, I have, I've, I've, I've developed the habit of asking, uh, and it's the same with Jason and uh, when you're talking to Amanda, like I ask, I ask my wife and I ask my friends actually, um, uh, what, what would you, what would be most loving or what would be most helpful right now? Do you want me to try to give you some, cause I, I, I'm yeah. sure you've been in a conversation when somebody you've been talking, you've been giving solutions to a problem and they're, they're whacking those solutions side to side, like, they, like you're fencing, like they're just like, you yeah, know, it's a, yeah, it's a brawl. Yeah. It's a duel. Now, exactly. Yeah. So it's, if that's mm-hmm. happening, I, I immediately stop. I'm like, Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. They don't, they, they're actually not. I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm missing the mark here. Yeah. And I, I know that that comes from probably an ego driven thing from me that like, I want to be, have the answers, you know? So like, I, I try to be like honest with myself about what it is, but. It was crazy though, Kirk, for me is I, I want what I want. I want what I want more than the thing that I actually want. Yeah. You know? So like we, we build these systems in place. So you and your wife are running a system and both of you, if she was on a call, by the way, another rule of coaching is you always coach the person in front of you, not the person they're talking about. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. She's, she, I'm the, I'm the one that needs the coaching anyway. I'll be honest. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We well, all do. And Come so, on. Yeah, true. Yeah. So we all do. And so we so we build these systems, and it's 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 crazy to me how many things I do with people that I want to build a good relationship with, that not only doesn't create a good relationship, but actually deteriorates the relationship. But I still compulsively do it, and yeah. that's a that's just a bizarre. And, and again, because I'm so drunk on being right, I'm so yeah. committed to to my way of seeing the world that I'd, I'd rather be, I'd rather stay connected to the thing that I'm trying to, um, I'd rather stay connected to being right about something. Yeah. The cliche is I'd rather be right than be in relationship. And now we're getting into Janet's territory. Can, can yeah. you give an example, Jay? Uh, not uh, the relevant one. I don't have permission to share. Let me, let me think of, uh, <laughs> I, right, recently yeah, started, right. I think well, you I mean, surfacing, uh, but. Uh, I mean, I, I also love this topic uh, just from my own experience, having been divorced and then in the dating world again. And then now I, I was, I just celebrated my one year anniversary with my, my husband, Ryan, right. uh, and just the experience of dating, uh, in my thirties was just interesting. And I feel like there's a lot of resources out there for relationship advice, but not around dating. And so I just zooming out, didn't realize how rigid I was as a 30 something year old in the dating world caught myself that, well, I just know what I want. I know what I'm after. Um, and there's, there's different, um, what's important to me is noticing that there's different types of people. So the advice for me might not be the advice needed for uh, another person. Right. Um, but at that time I was calling what I want is a person who's, who's uh, committed to growth because I'm, I'm kind of type A, a high achiever, I'm a coach. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, not really uh, letting the human in front of me flourish and be their version of that. It's like, no, I have my idea of what growth looks like, what what going after goals looks like. So this is what it looks like. And it's my own way to protect myself, ironically. From, from, from having hurt. to change, from, from having to change, actually. Or yeah. from having to change, yeah. yeah. Or, or to protect myself. I don't want another failed relationship. So- right you know what, if you're not fitting in this box, I'm just going to mark you off as it. it's not, it's not you. Yeah. Um, and so just realizing that, and thankfully I had a patient partner who was like, Hey, this, this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I was like, Oh, you're right. You're right. Um, so, uh, it's just interesting how anything even good can be abused or misapplied. Yeah. Um, and I think, uh, that that's, that's part of that. Well, this has been, I mean, it's been about an hour. I think we covered a lot of stuff. I, I do want to, I want to hear from you, you all uh, kind of what the vision is. We spoke a lot about, about vision today. I'm sure you're not running this firm without some pretty specific goals, but if you want to just give me a quick, kind of a quick rundown of what you're looking to do. I know philanthrop- uh, philanthropy is a big part of it and all of this, but um, I'd love to hear a little bit about what's, what's fo- moving forward for Novus Global. 
Yeah, well, there's, I'll, I'll, I'll take a swing on that. There's, there's two pieces. So there's Novus Global, and then there's the Institute for Meta Performance. Those are two, those are two babies. Those are two companies, and, and they're, they're separate entities. They overlap a lot in terms of faculty. So some of our top performing coaches at the firm are some of our best faculty at the Institute. And, yeah. and a, lot of time, a lot of people who graduate from the Institute get invited, kind of like a Top Gun program, into the firm yeah. to play. And so they're, so they're two separate companies. Uh, my favorite way of talking about it these days, Kirk, is the – so I mentioned earlier what a good coach does. We could also call this a high performing coach. So a high performing coach is going to help a person figure out what they want and then help them get it. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a problem with that though, is like, what if people, what if what people want sucks, (laughs) you know, and we don't, we don't like, we don't like to say that very often. Uh, And so it's safer to talk about it in, in the, in the context of like fiction. So like sometimes like when, when we, when Janet and Dan and I go on vacation, we'll, we'll wax poetic about how we would coach certain people from history. You know, like how would you coach, how would you coach Gandhi? You know, how, how would you coach MLK or, or people like that? Yeah. And then, and then also sometimes, I don't, I don't know, I think Janet and Dan both do this. We, 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 all three of us really love film and we love uh, media and, and television. You know, Janet and I live in Hollywood. Her husband is involved in the industry. Janet has been in, in the industry in various capacities and, mm-hmm. and Dan and I are, are, are uh, hobbyists, uh, I, I, you know, uh, uh, amateur aficionados, but <laughs> uh, you know, so it's, it's hard not to watch television and not, or watch movies and not think about how would you coach people and and usually it's how would you coach you know like Luke Skywalker yeah, yeah. Uh, heroic figures or, yeah yeah but like you know like you wouldn't want you wouldn't want Darth Vader to have a high performance coach no he could be so <laughs> he'd just be so much more evil yeah right you know like like you, you do an intake call okay Darth what's your vision you know and it's like <laughs> You know, I want to, I, I want to blow up a planet, you know, and you're like, well, let's get clear by when, yeah. you know, let's create some clear <laughs> metrics here. <laughs> right. And, and, and you, you don't, you don't, you don't want to do that. And so not because, because some people's dreams are other people's nightmares. And, and so there's this concept that we really care about. And if you're listening to this, uh, this is a shameless plug. If you're listening for this and you want someone to help you explore what you're capable of, whether it's in your relationships or your vocation, or even if you're exploring coaching or becoming a coach, uh, you know, we don't want to just care about a person's capacity to coach. We also want to care about their character. And in our world, we call that nobility. Hmm. And so our dream is that every person on earth would would have a noble coach in their lives, someone inspiring them uh, to go beyond high performance and not just, you know, not just caring about some kind of measurable outcome in their work or whatever. There's actually more to life than that not less but there's more right and and so that's that's the vision that's what gets us i think up in the mornings and and you know the only reason why we're here with you right now is because of jeff lambert and you can check out his interview with kirk which is really fantastic and and it really gives a nice glimpse into what the coaching relationship looks like and just to tell you these days i i only and a lot of our coaches are like this and janet and dan are like this as well but i only choose to work with clients who want not just to create a great life, but be a great person. And just such a great example of that. Yeah. You know, he, he, he really does care about people and he really does walking with him. He, of course, I'm in awe of his, the way that he creates and, you know, a top 50 PR firm. And now this, this tech company that currently has a valuation of $50 million and he's doing all this stuff. Yeah. But that's, and that's the easy stuff. Like that's, that's, that's just me throwing gravel under Jeff's tires where he already goes. Right. Uh, where I, what I really love is the kind of uh, husband he wants to be yeah, and the kind of father he wants to be and the kind of impact on the world he wants to be and his engagement in, in social justice and things that he cares about. Yeah. And then I, I probably would not have taken him as a client if he was not interested in that kind of thing. You know, and I know, I know Janet has clients that are exploring what they're capable of in a moral context. And I know, you know, uh, Dan works with one uh, hockey player named Andrew Ladd, and he's got this called the 1616 project, which helps with mental health and sports and, and young athletes, uh, emerging hockey players. And yeah, so cool. there, there's this, real, there's this beautiful thing that we're up to. And, th- and that's a long winded way of saying that's, that's, that's the bullseye is, is a noble coach for every person on earth. And, and I just, I just love that we get to do it, do that, pursue that with people that I actually would want to spend free time with if I had extra time. And, and uh, so th- and I'll say as, as we wrap up, I think that, you know, Kirk will land the plane, but Janet, Dan, thanks for being on the call with me. I always enjoy seeing you and, and then Kirk back to you. Yeah, no, I, that was, that was very, that was beautiful. I appreciate everything you said. It was, this was a very enlightening conversation for me. I kind of, you kind of highlighted some things that I probably, I, 
as with any learning, you kind of already know it usually when you learn it, you know, <laughs> like for me and my, at my age, I don't know if it's just cause I'm in my mid thirties, but so many of the lessons that my parents have been telling me that I, someday you're going to know, you know, like they're always so cliche and stupid about it. And now I'm like, I feel like these big epiphanies and they're just these cliche things that everyone's been telling right. me for 30 years, you know, and that, that was, yeah. this was today, but I, 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 first off for folks watching and listening, go check out novus.global. Is that the, is that the website? Novus.global. Uh, I, we have a few different, a uh, few friends of mine that are, that are, are big listeners of the show. And I know they're co they're in coaching. So you'll probably be hearing from them, I imagine. But uh, right. this is super, super great. I think it's a very, not to steal your word, it's a noble cause that you're doing. Uh, Jeff is a, the only guy that I know that's a client of yours. But even since I've, since he's coming to my kind of, uh, you know, on my radar, I can see him growing a lot as well. And, and the way he talks mm. about it, I, he's getting in really good shape now. He's always working out. So like, it's kind of really just trickling all out for jo Jeff. So <laughs> pretty cool. Yeah, it's fun to watch it. It's humbling because then your clients outperform you. It's like, crap, I need to go to the gym. Yeah. yeah. Well. <laughs> I saw you guys. You guys had like a company photo. It looks like the front of like an Abercrombie catalog. <laughs> we, well, you know what? That was a, that was David Gerber. He's another one of our top performing coaches. And this is what's fun. And not to keep belaboring the the landing of the plane, but no, no. that was our we we do annual retreats and we were all in Tahoe together. And Gerber Gerber's loves to do you know Ironman and triathlons and and he uh, he loves being uncomfortable physically. So anytime we <laughs> hang out, he's like trying to get us to like jump in fire or ice or something. And so we all, he got a bunch of us to go and, and get into the, 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 the Lake Tahoe ice during during the Bitter. beginnings of the winter and you know what we did look pretty good i was i think i think i look good because i have no body fat not because i have a lot of muscle this, this is different. those are not the same i think, the, the, the same I think models would tell you that the cold the cold is good i think cold kind of yeah, helps yeah, cold yeah. 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 i, I, I need to really do that before i go on my shirt off in front of that crowd but. <laughs> but yeah no i do appreciate it thanks so much for lending your your reputation and all that I'll, I'll i'll take good care of this episode i really appreciate you coming on if any of you if any of you know anybody that you think could uh, benefit from coming on the show, even if it's just a personal, I, I've had a lot of guests, most of them kind of just regular type folks, you know, that are just in regular day jobs and all that. But some of these folks have come just by having a conversation about themselves, which people tend to not do. Some of them have experienced like serious, very like serious epiphanies that like yeah. they, they're calling me months later. And sometimes it's negative. Like, Oh, I got out of that bad marriage, you know, because of what we talked about. But at the end of the day, I guess that's a positive, really, because they're not in the marriage anymore. But like, I can see how that would be intoxicating on your end to be inspiring to that just by the little taste of it that I've had here and there. Yeah. Plus, there are no such thing as normal folks. That's right. I didn't. Yeah, you're right. That was yeah. diminishing to, to them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So we're, we'd be happy to connect with anyone in your world. All right. We, I appreciate it, folks. Yeah. Thank, thanks. Take care. You bet. Thank you. All right. I'm really going to hang up now. I, I'm happy with it. Is there anything you want me to take out? And is there anything that you, you want to see anything in advance or are you happy, comfortable with me just going? Uh, that's up to you. That's up to you too. I, I think it was fine. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I it was wonderful. It was yeah. You, that was, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for, I really do appreciate it. You guys are awesome. Super. I, I always like being, I, in a, I like being in a room. You have a great radio like voice, by the way. <laughs> oh, really? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You have a great mm -hmm. uh, podcast host voice so. listen well, jason i really want to go i really want to be a stand-up com comedian as well and i know these are like immature goals but i spent my 20s and 30s like chasing after <laughs> like say like sales and engineering jobs and i but now i'm actually realizing like that's just what i want to do the whole time so i'm yeah. shedding the diminishing immaturity the immature comment <laughs> but like i really do i am i'm work i am making like aggressive strides to try and do that i'm just trying to you know i'm working on it but well, you know, and, and just to brag on Janet a little bit, the uh, because she we were talking the other day, we were in New York together, and she was saying, you know, she wants to she her, her back some of her background is in improv comedy. By the way, I was thinking about you, Janet, when when uh, Goldman Sachs today was talking about their humor thing. I almost right, you know, so like store that away because yeah. you should be doing you should be doing an improv uh, coaching Goldman Sachs breakout. But uh, the, the point is, is she done it and then she got serious and got a job that pays and that pays well. And now she's thinking about dipping her toes back into the art world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're, they are not mutually exclusive. They are, yeah. they are, they are synergistic and yeah. uh, beware of anybody who doesn't have an interesting life outside of the thing that pays the bills. Oh yeah. I've, I've, I was a lot around a lot of those folks in my life. I was one of those guys too. So I, I, I can't, I mean, you, you'll experience this too, Janet, but when I've, I used to love to write and I spent a lot of time doing that and I just stopped, you know, I got my job and I just like quit doing it. And I always wanted mm -hmm. to do it. And I would convince myself, well, I'm doing emails all day. I don't know, you know, while, <laughs> while I sat there and drank beer or whatever and watched TV or something, you know, right. but like reintroducing that to my life in a way that like was 
in this case, very regimented where I had to hit a date and all that, that would, that just did huge wonders for my like mental health too. Just being creative That's again. So like, yeah. So I'm excited That's for that, fun. for you to get back into that. But if you ever want to come on a show in a cre creative capacity, hit me up. That'd be cool. All you, right. And if cool. your husband too. Awesome. Well, cool. thank you so much. This yeah, has been thanks, great. Kurt. Thanks for coming on, especially since you guys are both sick. I appreciate, I actually appreciate <laughs> it, but thanks. Take care. Okay. Go drink yeah, lots of water. Lots of water. Not too much. Don't water. tell me what to do. Yeah, <laughs> oh, the real dysfunction comes out now. And the <laughs> See y'all. Yeah.